All right. Good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're at. I suppose. Uh, I. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to uh, to present this information. Uh, so I'm just going to be going through the the slides. My my first slide is uh, just over, overviewing the purpose of today's uh, the information I'm going to I'm going to be presenting. And the first purpose is uh, I'm going to present information that will be helpful for for those of you that are listening. That as you start to implement something like a, a direct instruction uh, um, approach in a school, you know, often often establishing the the kind of the this is why we're doing this. This is why this is so important. Is is one of the most important things uh, to address right off the the bat. Try to get the buy-in from everybody. And so that everybody sees the big picture, and so that's I'm going to address some of the um, information that uh, could be helpful, and and it's helpful for you know for us to keep in mind when we're doing a, a direct instruction implementation, but then to be able to communicate that to others. Uh, then I'm also going to be talking about uh, just some of the logistics that are involved with implementing uh, direct instruction, and so that's often one of the the hardest parts is that. Um, you know, we can get everybody trained, but it's just trying to set up a, a, a structure within our building, a schedule, uh, identifying who does what, and so that's I'm going to address some of the the, um, the logistics, but from a practical standpoint, um, I begin with, you know, like why is this so critical to have this in place for our students of need, and so I like to kind of begin towards ne or near the end. Of talking about you know what's really at stake here, and that's uh, when you, when if we look at the freshman year of high school when students enter, uh, we call this is from the Consortium on Chicago School Research, and it's called the on track indicator. But the the reality is, when students enter their freshman year, if they fail a single uh, class, regardless of the class, there's only about a 60% chance they would go on to graduate. If they fail two semester classes, regardless of the classes, uh, there's only a, that uh, drops to about a 44 percent chance. And if they fail three classes, there's the two thirds of the students will not recover from that. And so we know which classes they fail. I'm actually uh, calling today from Phoenix. I'm working with school where they identified, you know, from the middle school feeding into the high school, that one class that most kids are failing is algebra one. Uh, but if you think about it, if they fail that one class, there's only a 60% chance they're going to recover from that. And so, but the other classes they tend to fail are English and science would be the third one. And then, and then we have some schools where we have kids failing 40, 50% of their classes uh, semester one of their freshman year. And but the reality is, most kids will will not recover from that. Um, the, but the other question is, what do the kids have in common that are failing the classes? So who fails an algebra one class? It's overwhelmingly kids that are coming in with math skills that are not that don't have them adequately prepared to take algebra one. So they come in with third, fourth grade, fifth grade math skills, and we do things at high school like placing them in algebra one. And so, um, and then the, for most high schools across the country. Uh, if you fail a class like a free algebra and algebra one, the big plan is repeat it. And yet the problem is the kids that have third and fourth grade math skills, no amount of repeating that does any good because they still have third and fourth grade math skills. So if we looked at what kids, most kids have in common that are, are failing classes is poor academic skills. In fact, the, the, the majority of the kids have poor reading skills. So if you really want to know from middle school which kids are going to be failing classes in high school, look at your poor readers. Uh, they are at much greater risk than all of your other students. I always said that we really shouldn't be surprised by who's failing uh, classes when they get into high school because if, if we are surprised, we're not really paying attention because uh, it sh should be easily predicted uh, looking at the kids in the lowest 25% of their class in reading or 20 times more likely to drop out than everybody else. So. Poor readers coming in, uh, they have poor math skills, but they often have other traits. Like, you know, if we looked at the characteristics, they would have poor attendance patterns, poor motivation, 
often move around a lot. I was just looking recently at the research on mobility, uh, and that's the mobility research is telling us that the kids that come in, you know, that have moved around, if you move even one time and enter a, enter a new school, uh, you're at great risk of, of you know, having uh, social problems, of it being, of it being very traumatic for students, that that's even, it's double that risk if kids come in and they have poor academic skills uh, and then they move around. And so, but, and the problem with dropping out, it wouldn't be such an issue if once you dropped out you wouldn't to be successful anyway, uh, but actually nothing could be uh, further from the truth. Seventy-five percent of the students that, that drop out end up being incarcerated. So that does not mean that dropping out causes incarceration. It's not necessarily a causal effect. That is, think about that correlation, though, that, uh, you know, how, how much those two things go hand in hand. Um, and we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 7,000 students a day dropping out of high school. So think about 7,000 students today uh, across the country. And actually, we know that number to, to underestimate the true number. Um, that there was a story on CNN not too long ago where they were looking at high schools. That story came out of Texas. And they were showing how students or how high schools code kids kind of in clever ways uh, to make it look like they're not really dropping out when in fact they are. Because it's in our best interest to get in trouble from the State Department if kids are dropping out. So high schools will code them to make it look like they've, they've transferred, you know, or that they're in an alternative program when in fact the majority of those kids actually when they leave high school they drop out. Um, 70% of adults that are incarcerated then, uh, if you look across the nation, have poor literacy skills. 85% of juvenile offenders, I just heard not too long ago that when they looked in Ohio, for instance, 85% of the adults that were incarcerated uh, had, had been, were high school dropouts. And the vast majority of them had poor literacy skills. Interesting to note where we tend to um, invest our money as a nation. We spend three times as much to incarcerate uh, adults as than we do to educate students. And so we tend to invest as a nation on the back end of placing a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, in, instead of in the area of prevention, the things that we could be doing in schools, um, it, it's after the fact. Uh, interesting also, though, that it's, I call this, it's never too late. If you look at the, the research that if some type of literacy intervention that occur, it occurs, uh, once somebody is incarcerated, there's only a 16% chance they would end up reincarcerated versus a 70% chance if no literacy intervention occurs. And so that, so I always say that if it's not too late after they're incarcerated, it's certainly not too late when they're in high school. It's certainly not too late when they're in middle school, and it's certainly not too late when they're at elementary. But uh, it would be far better if we could invest early uh, and prevent a lot of the, 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 the uh, failure by having interventions in place. The earlier, the better, but it's never too late. Um, and the, it's actually, you know, b besides the uh, the things that are, are at you know at hand in terms of you know what happens if if kids drop out, that we also have to look at seventy five percent of what predicts academic success is how well you read, and so if you want, and then that goes has you know direct implications for the for kids passing state assessments. We tend to focus a lot on teaching the standards, and you know and, and have conversations about kids not passing state assessments, but if you actually look at it. The majority of kids not passing state assessments are kids with poor reading and poor math skills. And actually, in, in a lot, most states across the country, the single best predictor of passing the math state assessments, not your math skills, it's your reading. You actually have to be a better reader to pass the math assessment than to pass the reading assessment. And so, but think about if that's true in math, it's true in science and social studies, you know, it really, reading is really the single best predictor of, of students um, doing well academically. The, um, I have this uh, information from just, 
this is one of my uh, schools or a district I work with in Florida that is, and we're looking at the, they use the Scholastic Reading Inventory as one of their, their reading assessments. But if you look at how well the, the perf performance on the Scholastic Reading Inventory predicts whether kids are going to uh, pass the FCAT, which is the old state assessment but become prior, prior to Common Core. So it's even more so now. I'll show you a slide of that coming up. But uh, on the FCAT in the state of Florida, if you were in the below basic category on the far left of this on the slide, if you're in the, the below basic category, there's only a 10% chance uh, of only 10% of the students that read in that category pass any part of the FCAT. Uh, interesting that if you're a slightly better reader, you're in the low basic category, even fewer kids are passing. 7% of the kids that read in the low basic category pass any part of the FCAT. We actually don't know, know how they're doing it. They really are really reading so far out of range that we wouldn't predict you know, hardly any of them uh, would be able to pass it. I, I think that it's that um, evidently random guessing is better than if you think you know the answer. That's why more kids are passing in the below basic. Actually, I have a theory on that. The below basic uh, kids, a lot of them are probably on IEPs and receiving accommodations. Um, but look at what happens every time you change reading categories. If you go from low basic to high basic, and we're not talking about a huge jump in your reading skills, although you're a better reader if you're in the high basic category, 29% of the students that read in that category pass the FCAT. So it comes with a 22% increase over the low basic. Uh, a 22% increase if you go from high basic to low proficient. So 51% of the students that read in that category. So, and notice if you jump all the way to the right, far right hand side, 100% of the advanced readers are passing the FCAT. So what I take from this is being a fabulous reader on this does guarantee you're going to pass. Being a good reader, like in the high proficient category, doesn't guarantee it, but it puts the odds in your favor. Being a poor reader all but guarantees you're not going to pass. But if we want more kids to pass, all we have to do is get kids to change these categories. Um, this district had a hard time with that. They, they went to the old, uh, to the go-to when not enough kids were passing. They started having FCAT classes, uh, which is essentially teaching to the test, which is really a bad idea if you think about it. Uh, that instead of doing that, if they could have had the intervention classes in place, because they, this is a high poverty district, and so they had 70% of their students in the bottom three reading categories. If they could have had the interventions in place to get kids to change these categories, it would have come with a, a corresponding increase of, of likely to, likelihood to pass. Um, this gives us a, a little bit of insight as to this is one of the states I work in where we're looking, they use the, uh, the NWEA, the MAP assessment. And we're looking at historically, but prior to Common Core reading uh, or having skills at the 38th percentile predict on the map, predict passing their state assessment. Uh, but look at what it's now, now that they're, they've moved into Common Core, you have to be uh, pretty close to the 50th, 55th, or in math, almost the 60th percentile on map to have a realistic chance of passing their Common Core uh, aligned test. So whether you, your state uses Common Core or not, you probably have had you have you know higher standards. That's that's the that's the move that has occurred across the nation is that, that the standards have have increased, um, or the level of the standards have increased. So kids, in other words, kids have to have really good skills uh, and underlying skills to even have a realistic chance of, of performing on Common Core. I, um, this is from, I don't know if they, how many of you, if you're familiar with John Hattie's work on visible learning, but uh, you know, what I find is that it's, if you look across the nation, especially schools that are trying to improve outcomes, boy, we have a lot of real, real questionable things going on as part of core instruction, as part of intervention. Uh, I find a lot of uh, teachers being placed in the position of like trying to create stuff uh, trying to trying to create their own interventions or trying to take the the textbook that that's, that really was intended for tier one 
and then trying to convert that to make that into an intervention. And it usually falls in the category of what I call slower and louder. Uh, it's, but, but these are, you know, these are things that are, are well intended. But all of these things have one thing in common if you look at the research, and that is they don't have any, any real foundation in the research in, in terms of what are the outcomes that have been demonstrated to, you know, to, 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 be, uh, to occur when you are doing these things, whole language programs. So think 0.4 and larger means it works. So 0.06, you know, that is certainly not something that we should be doing on behalf of our, our, of our struggling learners. Uh, that doesn't even have a good track record with with typical kids, let alone kids that struggle. Uh, and so, but if you think like inquiry-based instruction, that it's just that we, you know, I'm always a little bit concerned when I see schools that are kind of running their own mini experiments. To see, you know, they'll say, well, we're trying this to see if it works. Uh, so, if you're doing inquiry-based instruction to see if that works, especially on the behalf of struggling kids that can ill afford to have something that has not been proven to work uh, being used on them, uh, you know, it's like we should not be running our own little mini experiments. There's no no reason to do that. We already know and can draw conclusions from the research that is out there. What's so nice about John Hattie's work is that this is based on all you know all of the studies to date. Uh, this was largely looking at meta-analysis, multiple meta-analysis um, on, you know, and, and looking at what works and what doesn't. So we should not be running our many, our many experiments in our schools. Uh, that's not how, you know, the, the, you think about the, the, work, the field of medicine, that's not how it works. Um, and then grade retention, of course, has an interesting, I'm in Arizona, that has a law that says if you're not a proficient reader by the end of third grade, and actually if you're, you know, if you're not reading in a cer at a certain level by the end of third grade, then it's mandatory you be retained. Uh, could there be a worse plan than that? It's like it, not only does grade retention not work, it actually has a harmful effect. And so uh, the, re the research on that is very clear. I, what I like about John Hattie's work is he did then, you know, presents these little like learning gauges or these little gauges to uh, to demonstrate whether something's effective. So what does work? Uh, mastery learning. Mastery learning has a really good track record. If you're in that zone of desired effects, it means it works. So mastery learning has a good track record. Worked examples. Uh, so we're providing a model. Lots of modeling. That has a really good track record. Um, comprehensive interventions for kids with learning disabilities. If you actually, when you look at the research and you look at all of the things that make a big difference, not just for struggling kids, but for all kids, we find that it's, it's things like uh, being very clear, very explicit, not leaving anything to the imagination, demonstrating, providing models. Uh, lots of clear models with clear language, clear and concise language. Uh, it's providing uh, guided feedback. It's a, it's a gradual release where it's an I do, we do. Uh, and a lot of we do is a lot of repetition. The one thing that stands out in the brain research is the amount of repetition that's required. And so, but, uh, so when you look at, then the, like, look at the track record here for comprehensive interventions, why do they work so well? because they bring all of those effective strategies uh, together. And, and, and so every lesson is being taught with that, uh, with that cohesive uh, structure. And that is one of the things that really stands out about direct instruction. Direct instruction, by the way, in John Hattie's work has a really good, uh, the implications, you know, that what the recent, all of the studies he looked at, Say direct instruction has a has a terrific track record. Reason being is because they bring all of those techniques together, uh, and so that's that's why we find you know those techniques are effective as a standalone, but when you bring them together, that's what this that, you know this slide on the comprehensive interventions is showing is the impact is is quite dramatic um, for for kids of need. Uh, feedback. And so you think about the amount of feedback that's provided in a direct instruction lesson. Um, the problem with most core instruction 
because sometimes I, I will work with a school that's starting to think about implementing you know, a structure where kids receive what they need. If they're behind in reading, then they're going to get what they, you know, they'll get the, the reading instruction at the level that aligns with, with their instructional level. Uh, but a lot of times what they'll want to do is they'll say, well, we'll just put a seventh grader back in fifth grade math textbook. And, and so, because that instructionally where is it where the student's at. And my response to that is that the problem with that, the, the reason why it's not going to work is because they'll be back in a, in a textbook that has the same structural problems that kind of that created you know, the, the learning problems in the first place for this student. It won't be, they won't, it won't be explicit. Uh, there won't be enough modeling. There won't be enough scaffolding. There will be too much new information presented in any, any given lesson. Uh, there won't be enough uh, scaffolding and feedback. Uh, and or systematic review, and that's that's what this uh, slide is talking about. The problem with most textbooks is they weren't really they don't teach the way struggling kids learn, and they violate a lot of the the rules about how struggling kids learn. We know if you look at the brain research, um, that it starts to give us insight as to why the interventions uh, like direct instruction why they work so well. Uh, and it's because that they're not violating all the brain rules about how the brain learns, especially how the brain learns for struggling learners. And so we know that uh, most memories, most things that we teach never get into long-term memory. Uh, and the reason that it never gets into long-term memory because it's a single shot. You know, we, we introduce it, we talk about it. Uh, kids take a test on it or something, and then that's it. And it's, it's rarely revisited. Um, the direct instruction programs are mastery programs. They teach to mastery. They incorporate information gradually and repeat it in timed intervals. So it's like the single skill will actually be being will be being worked on for for weeks, sometimes months. Uh, any new inform uh, lesson has only about eighty five percent or eighty five percent review and only about ten to fifteen percent new information. And so you can see that uh, it aligns to that part of the brain research. Um, that idea in the, the brain research tells us very clearly that idea that practice makes perfect uh, is almost never too true. It's perfect practice makes perfect. Uh, generalized practice uh, is really not that beneficial, especially for struggling kids, because what we tend to find is that we're getting a lot of wrong practice during that time. Good examples of that. I just, I, you know, one of the examples I, I throw out is I used to actually coach middle school basketball, and uh, if you took basketball middle school basketball players and you just took them into the gym and said, okay, just to go practice free throws, and did not provide instruction and coaching and modeling and feedback about the, the form to, that is required you know, when you're, when you're uh, engaged in a free throw, and, but you just let kids do whatever they're doing over and over, uh, what, you, what you find is that they, they tend to do whatever bad thing you're doing over and over, and then it becomes, uh, it, it becomes well ingrained and it's really hard to fix. So in the brain research, it's what we know is that perfect practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so what you want to have is perfect practice and at all costs avoid the possibility of wrong practice. So the teacher's role uh, is, if you look at the brain research about how you get things into long-term memory, is you're selecting the things that, you, that are worth getting into long-term memory. So select the smallest amount that's going to have the biggest impact. Uh, lots of modeling. Uh, ensure all the in, uh, any practice that occurs occurs uh, occurs in the presence of the teacher under the watchful eye of the teacher, so that immediate and specific feedback can be given. If if you think about it, if you're familiar with direct instruction, that that is exactly how the lessons are taught every single day, and it it goes back to it's why direct instruction works. It's why good interventions work. If they adhere to these rules. Uh, then it, the outcome is, is pretty predictable. If you violate these rules, like most, most uh, um, core instruction textbooks, they violate a lot of these rules. Not enough repetition, there's not enough modeling, then the outcomes are, are pretty predictable as well.
and so and direct instruction really kind of has that unique um, you know, feature of it it probably you know it sets the standard for all of this it has uh, it was you know, th these these lessons were designed with this and have more of these features than virtually any interventions I see. Uh, and I work in schools that have, uh, I'm a consultant, I work nationwide, so I work with schools that use all kinds of interventions. Uh, but rarely do we see the, the kind of, you know, uh, interventions that have as many of these features as what the direct instruction uh, interventions have. Um, so the then to summarize the, the brain research, uh, it's that perfect practice. Uh, the bulk of instruction should be in guided practice and avoid wrong practice at all costs. So avoid independent practice until you know they're likely, they're ready to do it. We call it the gradual release. And uh, direct instruction, I think, has, um, you know, ha has one thing that makes it so effective is that it has, uh, it has, that structure embedded into every single lesson. Uh, if you look at the features of effective instruction in the research, so you just went in and said, so what makes instruction good? You know, and so what you find is it has a whole lot of these. And so, uh, and so all nine the, the instructional tasks are uh, are modeled. Ex instruction is explicit. It's in, presented in very clear and concise language. Lots of opportunities, multiple opportunities, so repetition. Uh, students are engaged uh, and successfully engaged at all time and feedback is given. So again, I, I'm just trying to lay out when you're presenting or you know having your your school and staff members look and getting started with a direct instruction implementation, it's, I think it's important to understand, you know, what these, this intervention material has and what makes it work. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the things that I, everybody needs to have a very clear understanding of, is that, you know, this is, uh, it, it's the lessons are being presented, uh, they're formatted in a particular uh, way for a reason. And that uh, following those lessons then is essential, following them exactly the way that they were designed to, to be presented. Um, so I, I just presented some of that information here on this slide about what makes a direct instruction effective. It's in, in, in other words, it's, it adheres to all of these things we've just been talking about in terms of the, the brain research. So I wanted to, that has addressed some of the, the parts about, you know, getting people on board. They have to understand that what's at stake. They have to understand how interventions work and why they do what they do uh, and why we have to have, you know, well thought out, research validated interventions and can't just be trying to like put, put teachers in the position of creating stuff uh, and using typical textbooks and just trying to like, you know, uh, doing them in smaller group settings uh, or, or things like that. Um, I wanted to move now into dealing a little bit with the logistics. And so this first slide is just kind of a framework for, uh, for, a, for an RTI or an MTSS system. And so this framework is uh, kind of presenting a way that we can conceptualize it in our building or our district so that we're, you know, if you have to make this that implementation uh, efficient, or it's it probably will not be able to be sustained, and it won't reach the number of kids that are often in need of the interventions. So we have to have a framework to be able to provide it. So this first slide talks about uh, kind of the major steps. I like to like this uh, slide, and I know it's it's in really small print here. But this first slide kind of gives the, you know, in a one page, a one pager, here's the plan. So the first step is, and step one is universal screening. We need to identify which kids are in need and which kids are not. So whatever your universal screener, screener is, whether it's AIMSWeb or Dibbles or MAP testing or STARS testing or, you know, it's, but use that information 
as your first indicator of which kids would even be considered candidates. So intensive would be synonymous with Tier 3, but not synonymous with special education. I think of Tier 3 and intensive as these are our kids that are in a lot of trouble. So by definition, they are the kids that are below, at or below the 20th percentile. Uh, strategic would be the kids between the 20th and 40th percentile. And strategic and Tier 2 would be synonymous. And benchmark would be kids 40th percentile and above. And so I always think about, you know, I'm just we're classifying kids. You could be intensive in reading and benchmark in math. So we're, in, we're just classifying students as the need for the need of support that they, they demonstrate. If you're intensive, then you demonstrate you, you have, a, a, you have um, a need for intensive supports. So step two is saying that, so now we have a plan. This is our protocol. We, you know, we have a, intensive fifth graders in math, so this is what we provide. And the question, but it's not enough that we have a plan and we provide it, then it has to be highly effective for the majority of the kids that receive it. So the question is, is it highly effective for the majority of your students that are receiving intensive instruction, yes or no? If the answer is yes, uh, we, could, we could talk about a few kids for whom it's not working. That would be over on step three, which is what we call acute problem solving. And you can see it says complete ISO riot. That's just really a format for collecting more information about a particular student. So, you know, if we had intensive fifth graders in math, and this is we were carrying out a math intervention, something like connecting math concepts, and we can see, well, the kids that are in it are progressing everybody except for uh, Stephen or Jose. Then we could go in and say, well, it's worked. The system is highly effective. So the answer to, to that question is yes, but it's not working for Jose. So in step three, we could be asking, how do we uh, amp it up or intensify it for Jose? And so we would collect more information to try to identify why is Jose not doing well. Uh, I was in a middle school this morning here in Phoenix, and we identified you know, of the students not doing well in their direct instruction interventions were, were the students that, when we actually looked at them, uh, they were the students that were absent more often than everybody else. And so then we can identify, so what are we going to then change? And you're in step three, you're writing a plan. Um, step four would be, of course, going on to, to being considered for an IEP. The road to an IEP should be that the first you, you're, you receive interventions as you know that align to your needs. Uh, and if they don't work, we intensify them. And if you're still not making the, the level of progress that would be expected, then you would be considered for, as a candidate uh, for an IEP. Um, I always think I always say that you can tell a lot about your school uh, by you know how how um, automatic or how much, you know what happens when kids move in. Do you have a plan for when kids move in? Uh, my school B is, is the kind of school where kids move in and then that we're in reactionary mode from day one. So like this time of year, the, the middle school I'm at right now, they had three students move in uh, yesterday. Um, and so what happens? Do they, are they assigned classes? So you know they enroll and then we put them in classes and then it starts to dawn on people, the teachers over the next couple of weeks of like, wow, this student's really you know, not doing well. Uh, doesn't seem to have good reading skills, and then we make a referral, and we go through that whole reactionary process. We make a referral, we have to fill out paperwork, then a team has to meet, uh, and then they start looking at the student uh, that, you know, they do the pre-referral process, and kind of uh, uh, then a lot of those students might end up being evaluated for special education, and then they have to qualify. We can lose a third of the school year in that kind of reactionary mode. Uh, whereas school A, on the other hand, is, is saying, how can we be more proactive from day one? So if a student moves in roles today, we should have a, a plan in place for screening, conducting a screening, uh, so that we can identify as part of the enrollment process. So as the parents filling out the enrollment form, we are conducting this quick reading screening on reading and math. Uh, we're looking at, so are you a student in need of intervention, yes or no? If you are, then from that screening, more in-depth assessment would be conducted, probably through some type of placement testing. Like at the middle school I'm at right now, that's exactly what they do. They do placement tests. Uh, they identify, are you in, uh, so which, uh, it confirms what we saw in the screener, also then tells us which of the intervention classes and levels of intervention do you need to be in. 
And so but the goal is intervention occurs the day you move in. It starts. Uh, and it start, you don't have to qualify for it. You qualify because you need it. So we're not talking about placing kids in special education. We're talking about teaching kids to read. We're talking about improving students' math skills and but having a very specific plan. The school already has interventions because we have other kids that are in these interventions. And we will simply be plugging in a new student into one of those pre-existing intervention groups that we already have going on. Um, but it happens the day that the day they move in. So, and we also we typically don't ask for parental consent. Uh, we don't need parental consent to teach kids to read. We're obligated to do that. And so, this is intervention for um, for students that or come to us in trouble and, and the ideas that we have a plan for. I really like the, the concept of telling parents, rather than asking for permission, that we, we inform parents that, that we present it in a positive way, because it is. We should be saying things like that in other you know, communities, uh, when students are in trouble, that parents often take their kids to places like Sylvan Learning Center. Uh, and that, that primarily the parents that can afford that, we have an, an intervention in place where kids can receive uh, what they used to only be able to get at places like Sylvan Learning Center, but we have it for free, and isn't that a good thing? Um, so I am I'll move through my slides here. So in, in uh, summary, that we want to have you know, the school set up to one, we know one size does not fit all. Uh, that we have the supports prearranged and they're highly effective. Highly effective in the sense of that we're using materials that are highly effective. And so this slide, I just I already um, defined the, the three tiers. So I'm going to skip through that. I like this slide, the success zone probabilities, because it comes back to that, reinforces that idea uh, that the the uh, what the, what we're talking about with the tiers. If you're in tier three, low probability for any kind of grade level success. If you're in tier two, questionable probability. If you're in tier one, good probability. And so, if 30 per, or uh, 35 percent of your students in any given grade are in the red zone, tier three, then we need to have a plan for carrying out intervention for 35 percent of your kids. And I know that may reflect some kind of tier one problem. Uh, it probably does, but if if you have fifth graders and 35% are already in that tier three category, uh, then you have 35% of your fifth graders that need intervention. No adjustments to tier one is going to fix that now. Uh, it has already occurred. So we have to have a plan for, for the kids that we actually have. I would say we need a plan for the kids we actually have versus the kids we wish we had. The, and then I work with a lot of schools that have the upside down pyramid. That uh, and and when I'm different, when I show that slide of uh, you know some schools have the upside down pyramid, it just means that the structure that would be in place in some one school may be very different from what the structure that needs to be in place in another. Uh, high poverty schools may have a lot more kids that need to be in highly structured programs uh, and interventions. Um, so. You know, there's a various ways of being able to implement this in a school. You could have uh, direct instruction. Actually, people often don't re realize that a lot of the direct instruction programs like Reading Mastery, Connecting Math Concepts, were designed to be core programs. They're highly structured core programs. And so, uh, but you could use that as a core for everybody. And that's what I would recommend when we say, boy, you ought to really address your core then I, you know, some ways that we should address it is look at the appropriateness of the core. Is it structured appropriately for the, for the level of students that we have? If we have high poverty, we might want to look at having a highly structured core program like Reading Mastery. And other schools, that may not be necessary, so that we could be used as an alternate core. And so which means that we might have a core program uh, that doesn't have as much repetition, doesn't have as much modeling, and that's in place for the kids that don't need as much, more like your benchmark and your strategic level kids, but we have an alternate core in place for your intensive level students. So that would be, you know, for, for your kids that are below the 20th percentile. Uh, I always say that, you know, it's everybody in a core program, not necessarily everybody in the exact core program. 
Uh, some kids need more structure, need more of all the things we've been talking about, and they would be much better served in a core program such as Reading Mastery with that structure than to be placed in one that is missing most of that structure and then we're trying to intervene uh, on top of that to make up for, for all of what wasn't working during their, during the core, their core instruction uh, because of the, the program they're, they're in a, in a, a program that's not sufficient in terms of the, the amount of repetitions and the amount of modeling and scaffolding. So I, I just presented some of the slides here about using direct instruction as a core, alternate core, or supplemental. And it, it really, I view it as it would, you would either use it as, as your core as a alternate core for the kids that need it. And then some schools use it as, as supplemental. So the kids are in a core, uh, and then they get the intervention on top of that. And then that would be an exa example of it being used as supplemental. Um, so I'm going to skip past that. This, um, I call this a placement pathway. And it's really just mapping out how, so that we have decisions made about this is our protocol. This is, this is how we do business. You can see this as an example for math. Uh, but a placement pathway, this maps out what assessments we're going to use for screening. It maps out how we're going to define which, uh, how we're going to define our tiers. So intensive is uh, students that are between you know, the first and 20th percentile. Uh, and then for how we make decisions about who's strategic, who's benchmark. But then it goes further to say, so if you are considered intensive, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to use. This is what, how we're going to progress monitor. Uh, this is uh, you know, how we make decisions about who gets what. So I have just presented various uh, examples of the placement pathway. There's a kindergarten. I have a first grade. And I know we're getting close to being out of time. Um, the intervention sequence, I wanted to just touch on this briefly. The placement pathway tells us how to make decisions about who gets what, so that we have that mapped out as a protocol. The intervention sequence spells out what happens once you're placed. And so this example is using, if you were using reading mastery and kids are placed in reading mastery, so say you're a second grader and you're placed in first grade or kindergarten level reading mastery. What happens when you complete that level? What comes next? It's the next level in the sequence. When is intervention over? It's when you have completed the sequence. And so it really is specifying a treatment plan in terms of you know, where are we going with this? When does it end? And but how it's all connected. It most, in my experience is most schools do not have this well spelled out. And, and if it's not, then intervention is just kind of stuff. We have to know exactly where we're going with this with intervention. And this is kind of in recognition of there's no quick fixes here, right? So it's, it's a treatment protocol. It's that and the intervention's over when you complete that protocol. I have presented a couple slides here on walk to read or walk to intervention uh, just to show that how schools deal with the logistics uh, that you would walk to during reading time, you would walk to the class or the intervention um, with like level students. And so I know uh, that for in middle and high schools that we would have uh, classes devoted to that. So I have some uh, other slides that we're not going to have time to get through, just talking a little bit about staffing, scheduling, and materials. And so those are there for, there's the role for the principal, for the teachers, building coordinator. So I just have mapped that out. Uh, we don't probably need to go into all of that. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for your time. I'm going to turn it over to the, the questions. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Um, the first question we have is, what are some key ways to show that your students are making success during the year? We, I was just at a middle school uh, here in Phoenix where we were just looking at the, what we call adequate progress. And so uh, besides doing like the progress monitoring that goes on and that there's the assessments that are built into the programs themselves, so we administer those, but we also look at what's, what's happened to kids at the benchmark testing periods from fall to winter and winter to spring. 
And so we're looking at what percentage of our intensive kids from the fall to the winter have moved out of intensive. What percentage of our strategic kids from fall to winter have moved out of strategic? And so that is a really good way of evaluating the system. You know, it's like if we're, we, and we have a specific number of kids or percentage of kids we would expect to see moving if these interventions are paying off. That is the name of the game is that we're moving kids, if you're in that red zone, move them out of that red zone. So that, that's one of the ways that we do that. Great. Okay, another question coming in. Uh, how do you know when to change your core program? Uh, I, you know, one of the things I would look at is the, the percentage of, of your kids in free and reduced lunch. Uh, and then what are, you, what are your outcomes? You know, if, uh, I use a uh, trend line. And uh, when I start to work with the school, we almost always step one is to look at your trend line data. So what percentage of your kids are benchmark? What percentage of your kids are intensive? And how does that change over time? So in other words, uh, that, you know, if, if you have about the same percentage of kids at benchmark, grade after grade after grade, as they're moving through the elementary school or they're moving through the middle school, and the percentage of kids at intensive doesn't really, uh, doesn't really change, and it remains pretty constant, um, it, it's either that your core program is not being implemented uh, effectively and, and successfully, uh, or it's, it's not a good fit for, the, for, the, for your kids or at least a portion of your kids. And so I always, my question is always, what's going to change? You know, it's like if we're already teaching hard and everybody's doing it well, and these are the results that we're getting, it probably is a sign that it's a, it's a poor program uh, uh, problem. Great. Well, thanks, Wayne. It looks like that's all the questions that we have coming in for today. So I want to thank everyone for attending the event. Uh, reminder, this presentation will be on demand for the next 90 days. We'll be sending you a post-survey for follow-up to build future events. So thank you for your participation, and don't forget to uh, rejoin us for our next session, which is titled In-Depth Components in a Successful Direct Instruction Implementation in 10 Minutes. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.